I'm Mark Golub, here from the 2014 General Assembly. I'm sitting with an extraordinary human being. He happens to be a minister in the Israeli Knesset, but when you get to know him, it, it's so much more than that. It's my great pleasure to present Shimon Ochayon, who is with uh, Israel Beitenu Party. That's the party of uh, Lieberman. And uh, first of all, thank you for just joining me for your few minutes. Thank I, you. It's I, my I, pleasure, no, too. It, you, it's wonderful getting to know you. Now, Shimon, you ultimately had a career in academic life, correct? Yes. And you ended up at Bar Ilan University. Exactly. In what field? In education. In education, especially Jewish identity. Jewish identity. Identity, exactly. I've had people who talk to me from Israel who say to me, that although American Jews assume the issue of Jewish identity is only a diaspora problem, that the reality is that even there are even Israelis, even in Israel, the question of an Israeli having a Jewish identity as opposed to an Israeli identity is also a serious problem. Do you agree? I agree with you. Yes, of course, uh, we have to strengthen our Jewish identity. We feel that the problem in Israel it's less bothering us because we are living in our own state but to feel connected to the state of Israel and to feel that you are part of the Jewish people you have to work on your Jewish identity even if you are living in Israel if right now you are living in Israel because it's convenient for you or just you happen to be that you were born there the minute that you will see that you can have a better life outside Israel, I believe that you will leave the country. But if you got, if you have Jewish education, Jewish identity, and you feel that you are connected to the state, to Eretz Israel, it's, gonna, it's not going to be easy for you to leave the country because you feel that you are part of it. You are part of the history, you are part of the identity of the Jewish people, and we are part of the Jewish history of Israel, of course. How do you feel about the issue that's been raised over a lack of Jewish pluralism in Israel? And from the American Jewish perspective, it's all about the pluralism of American Judaism, and there are people who would love to import that into the state of Israel. How do you feel about American Jewish pluralism the state of Israel and the reason I say that is I talk to Israelis all the time who say I don't want to be quote religious by the way they're more observant than the secular here in America but they don't want to be involved in synagogue life because to many Israelis is either orthodox or nothing orthodox is unacceptable they therefore choose nothing and there is not the variations of Jewish observance that you have in the American Jewish pluralistic system. How do you feel about that issue? Well, I just, I want to tell you that I'm proud of the fact that we, uh, right now we pass, we have the law of conversion in Israel to help and to support people that came from the Soviet, former Soviet Union. Another word that we, we recognize the fact that there are Jewish people who didn't have a chance to get Jewish education and you have to make it easier for them and to help them and not to be strict by, uh, with them. And therefore, we are trying to do something to try to be what we call mekarev, that people will come close to you, to feel close to Judaism, to feel close to tradition, not to hate tradition, not to feel that you are strange to it. That's one thing. From the second thing, I do feel that we have a problem with the American jury. There is a problem. There is a problem. You have to understand that the majority of people in Israel, let's say the Sephardic communities, they didn't have a tradition of pluralistic religion. We had only one Orthodox synagogue. That's all. If you were religious enough or religious less or more, you were under one umbrella. The rabbi took care if you were Shomer Shabbat or you were not. You had, we had one rabbi. To come to Eretz Israel to start something that belonged to me, 
it was part of living outside. I can understand that we have a win in terms of social. If you want to build your community the style that you had in America, if it's on conservative or reform, but uh, to unite, to make our people united and not Halila, not God forbid, split, I don't think we have to bring uh, the situation that we have outside. It's not going to be easy, but I don't want to see people trying to open books, especially with the Orthodox or the ultra-Orthodox. I'm not going to marry people from this section. I'm not going to be to interfere. I will do everything that people from the reform and also, of course, from the conservative community will feel that they are part in Israel. But I would like to ask them to understand that we have to work under one halacha, not two or three halacha. That's the problem. It's not going to be easy. We went too far with the Soviet Union, people from the former Soviet Union, because I can understand them. That for 70, 80 years, they didn't have a chance to practice any kind of Jewish life because of the Soviet government. But thank God, America is a free state. They can do everything to strengthen Jewish education. And sometimes I feel that the Jewish community, not all of them, spent enough. They didn't make the right investment in Jewish education. I appreciate your willingness to share your perspective. I want to move on. You were in academic life, and then you went into politics because you are part of Yisrael Beitenu, Lieberman's party. Explain to me, number one, why did you leave the halls of academia for, poly for the Knesset, and why Yisrael Beitenu? Well, to be honest with you, because I was involved with so many projects in education, either it was with teachers, with the ultra-Orthodox that we wanted to bring them to the academy, with the Bedouins, with all kinds of projects in education. And probably in the party, the uh, Israel Beteno, they were looking people from some kind of uh, experience in education. So they offered to me, come join us and try to contribute what you are doing right now on a local, on a local basic, try to make it on a national. It happens to be that right now they told me, they told me that I was uh, uh, elected as a very, uh, as, a, as a, an active member of the Knesset, one of the nine, the most activists, uh, that we were selected, and especially in the Education Committee. Education Mas Committee. Alto. And I came, thank you, and I came to the, the Knesset with a special target to concentrate on education. Mm -hmm. And most of my working in legislation, it's in education. We spoke off camera that one of the things that you are most involved in is working with Jews who came from the Arab countries, from the Arab world. First of all, for our audience, what's the difference between a Sephardi and Mizrahi Jew? Well, a Sephardi is more connected to the uh, tradition with Sfarad, with Spain. I believe that most of the countries that they were close, let's say, for example, Morocco, Algiers and Tunisia, they are connected to the tradition of Spain. People, Mizrahi, they have something that to do with the uh, Mizrah, like let's say Iraq, Paras, and other countries. You also have been eloquent in identifying a problem that most American Jews are very unfamiliar with. Maybe the world is unfamiliar with them. The extent to which there were in Arab countries generations upon generations, hundreds of years of Jewish presence, which virtually ended as the State of Israel was created. Can you speak about that for a moment? Yes, of course. After the, uh, or close to the establishment of the State of Israel, Arab countries try 
tried and it's, uh, unfortunately they uh, succeeded in some way to hurt also the uh, Jewish communities, especially in Iraq, Egypt, Libya. And most of the Jewish people started to feel that it cannot, it's not comfortable anymore for them to live in these countries. And others, as a matter of fact, they were forced to live. They were persecuted, for example, in Iraq, in Egypt, in Libya, and other, in Syria, of course. So the history, the history of these Jewish communities, as a matter of fact, it's not known. I don't want to go now to the reasons. It's a, it's a long story what happened, but it's a fact. The state of Israel never spoke about the fact that we had over 850,000 people that were recognized as, refug as a refugees that left the Arab countries. They really didn't leave. They were thrown out. Yes. They were expelled. Well, uh, they were expelled in some, I mean, most of the countries, and some they felt. It's time to leave because the whole situation has been changed and the, uh, the government, the regime, is something the uh, French people left North Africa. So the, uh, the protectorate government was not working anymore. It's a, there is a new government and there is a big influence from the Middle East. So the whole atmosphere created some kind of fear that people felt that they have to leave the country and to move to Israel. It was wonderful for the state of Israel to have these Jews coming from the Arab world because basically Israel was, I wouldn't say desperate, but for Israel to survive, we needed in Israel a larger and larger Jewish population. Yes. Of course, of course, not only from uh, the Arab countries, it was not, uh, it was step by step, it was not easy because the, at that time the state of Israel could not afford to absorb and to bring all of them. So it was little by little, but most of them, and finally they came to Eretz Israel, and thank God everything right now, every Every Jew that left is living in Israel with their own family and really involved in the state of Israel and the culture and living, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. By the way, it did not apply the same way to Iran. Well, in Iran, Iran till uh, the Khomeini took over, took over. Also, we had uh, people, uh, a large community, uh, over 30,000 at that time in the beginning of the 50s that came from Iran to, to the state of Israel and a lot, of, a lot of them stayed there because they didn't feel don't forget that Iran had at that time had a good relationship with the state of Israel a very very close relationship so few people the Jewish people felt that they are secure and they don't have any Think uh, to fear. Right now, we have also close to 30,000 people that are living in uh, in Iran. Jews who are now yeah, still Jews, living in Iran. Of France. course, of there course. is a major Jewish community still of course, in Iran. Yes, yes. Which most American Jews don't realize. Yes. There's sort of this image that every Jew has left Iran, but, but it's not true. But in the Arab countries, but in the other Arab countries, the majority, almost 100 percent, of the Jewish people left. You have a few thousand, maybe 2,000 to 2,500 in Morocco, but the rest, you okay. just you have a few people. In your mind, is there a political consequence to the fact that Jews had to leave either because they were forced or out of fear? Basically, all of these Jews left Arab countries and came to the state of Israel. Is there any political consequence to that in your mind? And the reason I ask that is that we talk all the time about Palestinian refugees who left Eretz Yisrael as a result of 47, 48, 49. And sometimes people want to equate the Palestinians who left Eretz Yisrael during the War of Independence with the Arab, with the Jews from Arab lands who were forced to leave and left Arab lands virtually at the same time. And 
I don't know if it's a fair comparison, and I wanted to know your perspective. Well, of course, uh, some, you know, some point in a point of view that uh, that you can compare the fact that people left their homes, left their properties, and they were accepted, they were welcomed to come to State of Israel. The opposite thing happened with the Arabs. Instead, instead of helping all these refugees from from this, uh, from Palestine at the time, at that time, they're trying to put them in a special camps for all, for for forever. In matter of fact, and instead of helping them, helping them, they wanted also this problem to stay forever. And the UNRWA, also the UN helped this situation because 600,000 people became right now, according to, to the UN and to the UNRWA, uh, about 5 million. 5 million refugees, if we weren't talking about uh, something like 50, 60 years ago, we could help these people the same way. The State of Israel helped people that left the Arab countries, the same way that other states all over the world, when they have people moving from the one country to the another country, they help them they set to settle in the new country. The, the opposite happened with the uh, Palestinian refugees. I want you to help me understand this. And obviously, I come at this from a decidedly Israeli Jewish bias. But I want to see if I want to be as fair as I can be to the argument. The Jews in Arab lands who, for any number of reasons, left those Arab lands, very often thrown out of those Arab lands, basically were going home. They were going to a place that already was saying, Baruch Abba, welcome. You're coming home. Yeah. The same is not true for the Arabs who were leaving Palestine during the 47, 48, 49 years. There was no home for there to go to. There was no Arab state saying, welcome, Baruch oh, Abba. No. There, it was not a symmetry. And that the reason why a refugee problem was created for the Arabs, when there was none for the Jews, was that the entire context was night and day. In one instance, Jews are coming home. In the other instances, Arabs, they were not called Palestinians at that point. Arabs were fleeing from what they thought was their home. And there was no other country, no Arab country, which would have been home to them. So we might say, why wasn't the Arab world more welcoming of people who were losing their home? But there is not a symmetry between what happened to the Jews who were forced to leave Arab countries and came to Eretz Yisrael with where Palestinians, with Palestinians who were forced in their minds, for whatever reason, to leave their homes and go where? Okay. So I don't understand the symmetry. Okay, okay. Now well, let me explain to you. We have about 22 Arab countries. 22 Arab countries. They have the same religion the same language, the same history, the same culture, the same poetry, the same music, the same everything. There is no problem for them to accept them, to absorb them, to be part. There is no problem. There is no problem. By the way, when uh, the last war, Tsuketan, People from the Gaza, from the Hamas, were yelling and screaming to the people in Egypt, how come you don't come to help us? Do you know? I'm Egyptian. I came originally from Egypt. I'm living in the Gaza. The other one is from Iraq. He is living here. In other words, they are part of the Arab world, of the Arab culture. They are also the Muslim religion. So there is no, it's only a political issue that some of the leaders, instead of solving this problem, helping the Palestinian refugees, they made an issue, a big issue over it. It's a political issue. It's not, the, the, 
that's exactly the opposite. The state of Israel, instead of making a political issue, they helped their brothers to settle in the state of Israel. And we were from a different culture. Some came from Morocco, some came from Hungary, some they have the same, not the same language. Of course, everybody studied Hebrew, studied Hebrew, but still, coming from a different background, it was not so easy. You had immigration from all over. And the state of Israel, because they wanted to help, they managed to solve the problem. The Arabs didn't want to solve. It's easy for them. It's the same language that I said. Everything is the same. There is no problem from somebody from Gaza to settle in Iraq or in Syria or Lebanon. It takes two minutes. That's it. So you joined Israel Beitenu, Avigdor Lieberman's party. In America, Avigdor Lieberman is associated with a certain kind of approach to solving the Israeli-Palestinian problem. Sometimes I believe, Shimon, his views are very mischaracterized by the American media and even by within the American Jewish community. I want to know from your perspective, to what extent does Avigdor Lieberman express and articulate your own philosophy, what you would do to solve the problem? And my other question for you is, do you, when you're talking to your closest friends, are you married? Yes. Of course. So when you talk to your wife, do you, do you believe that there can be a solution where the Israeli and the Arab, the Palestinian, can ultimately live in some form, warm peace or cold peace, but some form of peace, side by side, in a two-state solution? Well, it's not easy, and I'm trying also to explain the, uh, the philosophy of uh, Israel Betenu, that is laid by uh, Victor Lieberman, of course. You have to understand that the situation right now shows us that the problem is not only a local. It's the whole area. It's the whole region. If you want to reach an agreement, you have to talk to the other Arab countries. You cannot talk about, for example, you think the problem is between Palestinian and the, and the, and the state of Israel? What's going on also with the Arabs in Israel? Look at what's happening now for the last two or three weeks. In another word, if you want to solve the problem, really solve the problem, the question is not to state. What do you mean two states? Uh, okay, we'll give one state to the Palestinians. What about the rest? Maybe the Bedouins tomorrow, they will ask for autonomy in the Negev. Maybe 52% of the Galil will give it also to the Arab uh, that are living in Israel. And what is exactly my Jewish state? Talking about two separate states without looking and the whole overall situation, what's going on in the region, solving all the problems together. For example, if some of the Arabs in Israel, they feel that they are Palestinians, part of the Palestinian, let's ask them to be part of the Palestinian state. They can stay in the same place. Give me, let us have the people that are living now in Judea and Samaria be part of the state of Israel. And for example, the Wadi Ara, the Mishulash, all these triangle where all the Arab is Israeli Arabs, that they, I heard them saying that they are part of the, uh, that they are Palestinians. When you ask uh, for their identity, they say, I'm Palestinian, I'm Arab, I'm also a citizen of the state of Israel. So, if you want to solve the problem, solve the problem, you have to think about talking with all the Arab countries in the area. It's a, it's a solution that has to be part of the whole region. And the second thing is that, of course, that meanwhile, of course, we have to live together. We have to live together. We have to spend time to work and try to prevent the incitement. You cannot talk about peace. When you go to their schools, in the Arab schools, you see how much they hate 
uh, educate their children. If I want, to, if you compare the, cur the curriculum in our school and the curriculum in their schools, you see a tremendous gap. So if we want to talk peace about peace, let's first of all try to change the atmosphere in education. Let's prepare ourselves. Let's prepare the next generation. Unless it's something that, you know, people said, let's leave Lebanon. Now we left Lebanon, you have Hezbollah there. And they are frightening us what the next war will be much more terrible than Tsukaitan. We left Gaza, we left the Gush Katif. We got thousands of rockets. You cannot run away and just then believe in two words, two separate states and peace and, uh, and peace now and peace. Uh, what about peace tomorrow? Peace or just for a moment? I to bluff myself, to cheat myself. Why? I have responsibility for the next generation. And we have to think about the next generation. We want to live in peace. We were educated to live. The Jewish people always were educated to live in peace. We want, but we don't want to cheat ourselves. I think it's really... I understand. So are you optimistic either in the short term or the long term? Oh, I, uh, I'm always optimistic. I'm trying to do <laughs> everything that we have to do everything. I want to know but, uh, if you're uh, a let's say, let's say uh, Exactly, optimism. exactly. I yeah. think that's a combination <laughs> of uh, realistic and optimistic right. and not pessimistic. Yes. I think there is a difference between uh, being uh, realistic that and just uh, talking about uh, pessimistic. We want the peace, but we, we don't want our children, the next few... Uh, generation to pay the price yes we have to think about and to give them a real peace to prepare them for a real peace there's so much more to yet talk to you about i hope you'll let me have another time with you i want to talk about the work you're doing documenting the life of Jews who are from both Sephardic countries and Mizrahi countries. You're also doing wonderful work for teachers in the state of Israel and the way teachers are being treated. It's a difficult problem for the state of Israel, correct? So there's much more for us to talk about. But I wish you kol tuva hatzlacha. You're a wonderful, wonderful spokesperson for the state of Israel. It's been a delight getting to know you. So please promise me we'll have more. Of course. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Shimon Achayon, who is a member of the Israeli Knesset, member of the Israel Beitenu Party, here at the 2014 General Assembly. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.